Hey, it's Rob, and I am out of the hospital. Still on the road to recovery, but God is faithful, and I'm doing well. And I want to thank all of you for your prayers and support during my little stint at the Parkview Resort. The staff was excellent, and they did a fantastic job. But through this time, I began to ask the Lord, how are we as his church supposed to respond in light of this continuing crisis and the effect that it's having on humanity? Of course, uh, there are several thoughts. There's the conspiracy theories, there's the political agendas, you name it, they're out there. And I'm not determining which one is or isn't true. I'm wanting the Lord's perspective as to how he desires his body to respond when these things happen, and they inevitably will. But sadly, the church that represents the followers of Jesus Christ is showing the world that we seem to be having a real hard time uniting on anything, particularly COVID-related at the moment, and in fact revealing more of a divided front than what we ever should. We must remember that even though we are imperfect, we are required to represent Christ well in everything, especially in times of crisis. After being involved in numerous conversations with pastors and community leaders across the states about how we as the church are responding to the COVID-19 crisis, I have seen the following four prominent examples. The first one represents the church who succumbs to every government dictate, miscontextualizing the scripture reference regarding obedience to authority. It's not about fear for them. It's about what they feel to be a godly submission to government. But how can this church expect the lost and broken to be delivered from bondage by a malleable Savior? What about when the secular mandate crosses the line of reason or even becomes unscriptural? This church has forgotten that although God appoints all authority, he does not expect the church to bow to ungodly leadership. The second is the church who rejects all government authority. When it comes to the function of the church, they do not believe that they have any obligation to adhere to even reasonable secular leadership that may actually have the best of intentions. How can a sinful world be led to salvation by a rebellious Savior? This church has forgotten that God has appointed all authority to be his executors of righteousness. If these authorities are operating within the guidelines of their God-given appointment, then we are to work with them in accomplishing the goals of righteousness. Next is the church who is driven by fear. They have eaten from the forbidden fruit of faithlessness and are being led by every fear-mongering report they hear from the perspective of a secular worldview. How can a hopeless world be comforted by a spineless Savior? This church has forgotten that the spirit of fear is not a gift of the Holy Spirit, nor is reacting in fear a fruit of their salvation. The fourth example is the church who is equally driven on the opposite end of the spectrum by a finger-pointing condemnation that masks itself as a superior faith. They hold in contempt those with any other view than that of being able to pick up serpents without incident as being faithless and a reproach to Christ. How can a vulnerable world consumed with fear trust their heart to a prideful, condemning Savior? This church fails to remember their responsibility to humbly uphold the weaker brother in order for their faith to grow into maturity. But the final example is the one I hope to be. This church is not driven by fear of the world's narrative of current events, but is led by the Holy Spirit in a sincere effort to be sensitive to others so as not to create needless offense in order for their gospel message to be received and instill seeds of faith, hope, and love 
into the heart of the hearer. This church understands that their meekness must never be misinterpreted as weakness. As it is reasonable, we are to be amiable, but never to be broken by the world system. They serve a Savior who is mighty to save. This church understands that there may in fact come a time when the world's authorities have overreached their appointed calling, and they will be required to declare their obedience to God over man. Not out of a heart of rebellion, but out of a heart of submission to God. They follow a Savior who is a righteous judge, who resists the proud, but pours his grace upon the humble. This church understands that their God is not moved by fear, but has empowered them to comfort the hurting and speak hope to those who have lost hope. They look to a Savior who brings deliverance to those who are captive and mends the hearts of those who are broken. This church understands that they must never allow their faith in God to become a badge of pride or a weapon used to beat those who have contrasting opinions. Their faith must be the catalyst from which they humbly lead a watching world through the waters of uncertainty, revealing the strength of God's Spirit and the purity of His love. This church is the united gathering of the followers of Jesus Christ. This church understands that their ultimate and only priority mission is to take the transformational power of the salvation message of the gospel to a lost world, making disciples of those who have been transformed who will then go and do the same. Some may say that the church's response to this crisis would qualify as a non-salvation issue. As far as determining our eternal destiny, I would tend to agree. But in determining the power of the gospel as manifested in the lives of believers in Christ, I would like to challenge us. How am I representing Jesus in the midst of this crisis? Is my life example drawing a lost world to a gracious and merciful Savior? Is my confidence in Christ exemplifying the power of the gospel? Apostle Paul instructed us to provide proof of our personal salvation experience. Are we ultimately led by worldly powers? Are we driven by a need to resist authority? Are we consumed with fear? Are we promoted by pride? Maybe it's time to reassess whether or not we truly believe that the gospel alone has the power to save, the authority to lead us from the beginning of our salvation to its completion, the ability to heal our hearts, to quell our fears, to eliminate our prejudice and cover our offenses against a holy God. Have we truly trusted in the gospel message to save? And none of what I've shared is meant in any way other than to challenge those who have trusted in Christ as their Savior to rethink how we are presenting the gospel as the power of God to save a lost world, directing them to our Savior in the midst of life's crisis. May God bless each and every one of you and your families with his peace, as together we depend on him to help us navigate these uncertain times with the gospel mandate in our sights. Thank you for watching, and have a great day. God bless.